Hey everyone, Matt here with Night Run Studio, and in this video, we're gonna get our enemy attacking. We're gonna add animations, a cooldown, and we're also gonna set things up so that we can add dodging and eventually blocking in the future. Let's get started. Now for this video, you will need an attack animation setup. If you're not quite sure how to do that, check out the video we did a little earlier in the series on how to animate. We don't need to do left and right as we'll use the flip ability to attack on both sides. I've actually created a up and down attack as well, though we won't be adding those in this video. If that's something you're interested in, be sure to let me know and I can do an extra video on that topic. Now if you've been following along in the series so far, we've got our enemy set up with two states, his idle state as well as a chase state, and if he ever gets close enough he will deal damage on contact, however that's kind of lame looking. We want to set this up so that he actually does an attack animation and gives you time to dodge. So let's head into our enemy movement script as this is sort of the hub for all of our state changes. We're going to begin by scrolling all the way to the bottom where we'll add our new state, attacking. Now at the top we can create our first variable. This will be a public float called attack range and I'll initialize it to 2 which is how close the player will have to get before the enemy attacks. Then we'll head down into update which is currently running our chasing state which flips the enemy and chases the player. At the moment it's pretty clean but as time goes our update method is going to get very full if we continue this way. So in the interest of separating concerns and keeping our code readable, let's take all of this chasing logic out of here and create a void chase method where we can put it. Then in update all we'll do is if our enemy state is chasing we'll call that chase method. Next we'll just add the other possibility which is that our enemy state goes to attacking and here we'll do all our attacky stuff. Now at this point we need to update our change state which currently just exits the current animation, stores whatever state we're currently in and then updates a new one. So let's begin by leaving the attacking state if we happen to be going to a new state and we'll make sure that at that point our bool for is attacking gets set false. We'll then do the same so that if we're entering the attacking state we set that animation to true. Now at the moment we're never actually entering this attacking state. So let's actually head up to our chase method and what we're just going to do is make an if statement so that if the distance, this is a unity helper function where we just put in the position of one object and another and it will find the distance between them. So if the distance between the enemy and the player is less than his attack range, then he wants to start attacking. We'll then put the rest of this code into an else if statement so that it only evaluates if we are not supposed to go to attacking state. With that we can save this and test it out. Back in Unity I'm just going to click on my enemy and go to my animator. You'll see that I've got three new states here, one for each of the animations I created. I'm just going to simplify the names first of all. I'll call these attack, attack down, and attack up. Again I won't be getting into the down and up attacks here but if you're interested in seeing how to do that please make sure to leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. At this point we need to create a new parameter. I'll just make a bool called is attacking. On entry, we'll transition to attack if is attacking is true. We'll then make a transition out of attack, which will have no exit time, and the duration will be zero. This will happen if is attacking is false. Now we'll just take a second now to go to our assets folder, find these animations, and make sure to turn off looping so that we don't attack eternally. Now when we test the game, there's going to be all sorts of strange shenanigans going on. First of all, when he comes in, he does attack, but he never leaves that attack state, and he continues to have velocity as he drifts across the map. I can leave and re-trigger this, but the same thing keeps happening. So we need to first of all get his animation state to leave attacking, and we also need to stop his velocity. Alright, so in our enemy movement, the stopping velocity is very easy. We're just going to come down to this update method, and when we need to do attacky stuff, this is going to be a perfect moment to go rigidbody.velocity is equal to, and we're just going to set it to vector2.0. That'll stop the enemy in his tracks anytime he's about to attack. Next, we're just going to head into our enemy combat script, where we'll make a public void method called attack. And in here, we just simply for now want to print a debug log saying attacking player now. Now getting our enemy to attack and then leave the attack animation can actually be done entirely within Unity. So let's go to our enemy and click on his attack animation. If we click on the point in the attack where he actually attacks, we can add an animation event which will create this function box here. If we click on that, we can select from all of the functions in the scripts that are on our enemy. In this case, let's make him attack here. 
we can then go to the end of our timeline, add another animation event, and well clicked on it, let's now add the change state. It will then give us a parameter box where we can select which state we'd like to go into next, and we want it to be idle. And so now when I come within range, the enemy comes to attack, stops, and swings. He attacked the player once, then went back to idle. Now you'll notice that range is a little large, so I might go to my enemy here, and while I'm clicked on him, let's change our attack range. Let's try 1.5 and see how that feels. So now I'll walk out of range, come back in. That looks not too bad, but still a little strong. You can fine tune that however you like. Now we do have one little problem. While he's going back to idle, he's not noticing that the player is still within range, and so he's just attacking that once and then stopping. So we can fix this in our enemy movement script. We'll just head down to the on trigger enter method. And at the moment, because it's an enter method, it only triggers when the player enters. But the player doesn't re-enter after each attack. So if we change this to on trigger stay, our enemy will recognize the player still there and keep attacking. This actually isn't the best way to do this, and a little later in the video we'll fix it. But for now, let's just go with this so that we can test our progress. Now when we start the game, the enemy comes over and keeps attacking. It's looking good. I forgot to fix this. It's still 1.5. There we go, 1.2. That's a nice range. Now the only problem is here we want to add a cooldown so he doesn't attack constantly, and we also want to add some damage dealing. Let's start with that damage dealing, and here we're going to do something really cool. In our enemy's attack animation, on this frame right here where the torch hits the ground, let's have our enemy do a search within his weapon's range for the player. That way if the player dodges at any point in the animation before this, he'll evade the attack. Now to do this, let's click on our enemy and just create an empty as a child. We'll call this the attack point. And let's just move it out in front of the enemy a little bit. With that set up, let's go to our enemy combat script where we can make a public transform reference to that attack point, as well as a public float for our weapon range. Lastly, we need an efficient way to check if the player is within range, and for this we're going to use a layer mask called Player Layer. I'll show how that works in a moment. So how do we check within our weapon range for the player? Well, let's head down to Attack, where we're going to make a Collider 2D array called Hits. Essentially, this will just make a list of all of the objects within the enemy's range that are on the player layer. Now to find this, we're going to make a Physics 2D Overlap Circle All, which will just create an invisible circle around the weapon. This will originate at the attack point dot position. It will have weapon range, that will be the radius of the circle. And finally, it's going to look for objects belonging to the player layer. Now that we've checked for a player, what we can do here is check to see if hits.length is greater than zero. That just means if there is more than zero elements in our array, that means we've found a player. Now at this point, we're ready to deal some damage to that player. If you've been following along in this series, your player will have a player health script. Just in case you haven't, here's what that looks like. It just has this change health method where we pass in an amount, which is how much damage we want to deal. So now if our enemy has attacked and found at least one player object, he wants to deal damage to it. So let's go hits zero, the first element in that array of players. And then we're going to get component. We're going to look for player health and call the change health method. Here we just need to pass in how much damage to deal, and we have a damage integer here. So let's type damage. However, we don't want to heal the player with a positive number, so let's make it negative damage. In Unity, there is a little setup to do. First of all, let's click on our player, go over to here to layer, and make sure he's in the player layer. If you don't yet have one, you can just add a layer down here. Next, we'll click on our enemy, open up the combat script. We'll drag our attack point into the attack point box, and then let's set our weapon range to say 1, and then for player layer, just select the player. So I've just set my attack range and weapon range to 1.2. That's a little out of control for the weapon range as it exceeds his attack range, but that's okay. You'll see now that he attacks kind of like a maniac, just in rapid succession, which means we could really use a little bit of a cooldown here. So let's head into our enemy movement to set up that cooldown. Before we go anywhere though, I'm just going to grab this attack range and move it up by my speed. I like to keep my public variables and private ones separate just for organization's sake. At this point, let's create a public float called attack cooldown. I'm going to initialize it to 2 seconds. Next, we'll make a private float called attack cooldown timer, which will be what actually counts down our cooldown. Now at the top of update, we can make an if statement where if our attack cooldown timer is greater than zero, so cooldown is in effect, then we want it to count down. We can do this by making the timer subtract time.delta time. 
Now down here in Chase, we'll just make it so that if the player is in attack range and our attack cooldown timer is less than or equal to zero, then we will attack. At this point, we'll want to reset our cooldown. So we'll make the attack cooldown timer equal to our actual attack cooldown. Now when we get in the game, things will actually appear to have gotten worse. When the enemy comes over, he kind of attacks, but no animation plays. He charges the player, and you'll notice that every two seconds he's kind of freaking out. That's because he tries to enter the attack state, but immediately gets sent back into chasing. Now the reason we're running into this problem is in our on-trigger stay method. And essentially every single frame it's checking for the player and then sending us back into the chase state so he doesn't have time to finish attacking. Now you'd think we could fix this by just putting an if statement so that it only goes back to chasing if the cooldown is run out. However, on trigger stay doesn't work that way. If we wait two seconds, it will actually not know the player's there anymore unless the player moves. So to make this method more powerful and more future proof, we're actually going to refactor it. We're going to make on trigger stay into a new method called check for player. Let's we'll scroll into update and at the very top, we're just going to call check for player every single frame. So we'll always look for him. So to check if the player is within the enemy's sight, we'll do something similar to our combat where we checked if the player was in attack range. We'll make a collider 2D array called hits and use physics 2 dovernorlapcircleall to check for it. Now for this to work, we'll need a couple of different variables. So let's create a public float called player detect distance and initialize it to five. Next, we'll make a public transform called detection point. I like to make this separate from the enemy so that I can set it out in front of him so he sees further in front than behind. Finally, we'll make a public layer mask called player layer. Now we can input those parameters. We can make it so that our circle originates at the detection point dot position. It will use player detect distance as its radius. And finally, it will look for an object in the player layer. We'll use an if statement here to check if hits length is at least one, which means that it actually found a player. And here we're gonna use this player variable to cache a reference to the player's transform. We can now delete this old code as we've essentially done the exact same thing and now have a reference to our player's transform. Now, if we go up into chase here, we can actually grab the logic that takes us into the attack state, leaving chase now with just flipping and actual chasing. Check for player will now handle our logic for state switching. So now after we have found a player within sight, we'll check to see if that player's in attack range and if our cooldown is in fact ready. If so, we'll reset the cooldown and head into attacking. Now we'll account for our second possibility, which is that the enemy can see the player, but is not within attack range. To check this, we'll just borrow this vector2 distance here. By the way, we don't need this transform word here, as we've already cached a reference to the player's transform, and this can just make our code a little more readable. So if the distance is greater than attack range, we just want to go into our chase state, as the enemy is not close enough to attack. Now let's just account for the one other possibility. I'll add a close bracket here, and let's assume that at the very beginning, the enemy can't even see the player at all. So our hits.length is not greater than zero. In this case, we want to go to our idle state. Now with that done, we actually no longer need this on trigger exit method at all. However, I do like this line here that sets our velocity to zero, as if the enemy's been chasing, we don't want him to keep that velocity and drift across the screen. So now before going into idle, we'll just set that back to zero. We can now get rid of the exit method altogether. Now in Unity, we'll just set that up by clicking on our enemy, making sure that player layer is in fact player, and then we also need a detection point. So let's right click on the enemy, create a new empty. We'll call this one detection point, and then we can just drag it into that box. Now at the moment, the detection point is right on our enemy. I like to set it out in front so that he sees further in front than behind himself. If you'd like a little visualization for this on the screen to see a circle, we'll add that later in the video. And so now when the player comes within range, the enemy will chase, he'll swing, wait two seconds, and then attack again. All right, now you'll notice on that last frame, he didn't quite finish his attack. If you like to, we could in our enemy just touch up his animation frames so that perhaps we don't call this method on the exact frame that it comes down, but allow it to actually play for a second and then deal the damage. That'll give us just that little bit of time so we actually get to see the animation finish. All right, and with that done, now the enemy will finish that last stroke. Excellent. Now, if you'd like to have a little visualization so you can actually see the circle where his detection range is, we can add that into our enemy movement script. Here, we'll just scroll all the way to the bottom and create a private void method called onDrawGizmosSelected. Here we can pick a color for our gizmos. I'm gonna set mine to red. 
And finally, we'll just create a gizmo which will draw a wire sphere. This will be similar to our overlap circle in that we pick a origin point, the detection point dot position, and also a radius, the player detect range. Now in Unity, while clicked on the enemy, we can just actually enable our gizmos here by clicking the Enable Gizmos button. You can toggle it on and off, and we'll now have a red circle showing where his sight is. We can change that number, and it will dynamically change the size of the circle. All right, we've now got an enemy who can deal damage, and he's pretty customizable. The only thing missing now is to add some knockback, and then we can make it so that our player actually deals some damage. We'll get to that in the next video. Until then, this is Matt with Nightrun Studio. Cheers.